Now, we're going to read together tonight from the Old Testament Scriptures. We're reading from the book of Leviticus, and we're reading from chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6, and commencing to read at the 8th verse. Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 8. And it has to do with the law of the burnt offering. Don't get com- confounded or confused by that. Don't uh, become anxious to say, well, I don't know anything about this. Just let me develop my message, and the Lord will interpret it to your heart. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar, and he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments, and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Of course, in the book of Leviticus, there are many instructions that are given to the servant of God, Moses, as to how this unique people who had been called by God to himself and now whom he had brought out of the land of Egypt, out from bondage and slavery, which is, of course, a type of salvation, and brought them across the Red Sea and brought them out to a place of deliverance from the dominion and, uh, of Pharaoh, uh, the ruler of the land of Egypt. And every man or woman who is saved There are parallels in that few sentences to a great and gracious work of salvation because by nature and by practice we are slaves in sin. The Pharaoh of this world, the devil, has the upper hand and control of our lives and we find ourselves fretting under the awful yoke that is placed upon us. But glory to God, there's a deliverer who comes And in the Old Testament Scriptures, the deliverer who came was a man called Moses, called by God. And he led the people out. I can tell you that a greater than Moses is here tonight. Amen? A greater than Moses is here. He is none other than Jesus. And he said, I have come to deliver. And praise God tonight. There's a lovely old hymn says, "'Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. "'Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. "'Tis the grandest theme that the world ever sung. "'Our God is able to deliver thee. "'And down through the years of our ministry, "'now, what is it, 55 years or I'm sure or more "'that I've been in this wonderful ministry "'of preaching the Word of God in this land "'and in other lands, And whatever the addictions have been, and even demon possession and bondage, we have seen people set free. And thank God tonight, He sets the prisoner free. He has come to set the captives free. And some years ago, we had the queen, former queen of the black witches, stay in our home. Her name was Doreen Irvine. She went to a crusade in the south of England, And she was so full of demons that whenever the preacher began to preach, she was so mad that all she wanted to do was get into the pulpit and tear him down and tear out the Bible. 
But you know, she was so hemmed in because there were so many people that she couldn't get to the pulpit. And then as the meeting proceeded, Betty Lou Mills, a beautiful gospel singer, stood up to sing, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus. How I found in him a friend so kind and true. I would love to tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. And while she was singing, this woman who stayed in our home and preached and ministered in our church congregation back in the 1970s, as Betty was singing, she was already out in the aisle and making her way out of the meeting. And then the chorus came, No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. No man had cared for Dory. She was abused from she was an early teenager. And she got herself into that state of bondage and darkness where she could make herself invisible, where she could kill a bird in flight by simply pointing at it, walk through fire and not be burned. And over the succeeding months of that wonderful encounter under the singing of Betty Lou Mills, this woman was delivered of many demon powers and then became an instrument for the Lord Jesus Christ and became an evangelist and a channel of blessing. I tell you, there is nothing too difficult for Jesus. He saves the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. This evening, a few evenings ago, uh, Anita sang a beautiful song made by, written by a prisoner with a, a crime history of most heinous crimes who was so transformed by the grace of Jesus Christ and sat down and wrote a song about the power of the cross. And that cross work tonight is available with all its living power to everybody who will just tap into it. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. And as you come just as you are, then he will take you as you are, and he will make you into what he wants you to be. And then he will begin to fashion you and mold you as he gets you on his wheel like a potter with a, 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 a pot on its wheel. And he makes it into a beautiful vessel. And he will take your life. And then by the ministry of his Holy Spirit, he will come to fill your life. And when he does that, a sacred flame will be kindled in the altar of your heart. And you know, that's the spiritual parallel of this wonderful verse from an Old Testament background. I know there are many other principles that can be drawn from this because our Lord Jesus was the full consecrated offering. He was the burnt offering consumed on Calvary's cross by the flame of divine justice. I know all of that, but I know that there is also a secondary application in that there can be within my heart a living flame, a fire that should ever be upon the altar. It should never be put out. My friends, God is a God of consuming fire, but he is also a God of unctionizing, anointing fire, that he can take our hearts and he can set them aflame with his divine love. It is such a primary, significant thought in the Scriptures. It goes right through the Scriptures. Flame and fire is very much part of the revelation of God in the Scriptures. And when the day of Pentecost came, and we celebrated that just last Lord's Day, when the day of Pentecost came, he came in tongues of living flame. He didn't come in a tongue of living flame upon our blessed Savior when he was anointed for public ministry. He came in the form of a dove. And you know why the difference? Because we have a sinless Savior who needed no fire to burn up any dross 
or any carnal pride or sin within his heart. He came as a dove upon the Savior, anointing him for the ministry that he would carry out in the following three and a half years. But when he came at Pentecost, he came to consume. He came to burn. And when Peter was describing what happened as the tongues of living flame came upon those believers in the upper room, he said, God put no difference between these Gentile believers who have believed and us purifying their hearts by faith. Oh, my dear people, if that is what is the lasting blessing of Pentecost, tongues may come and go, the wind may blow and go, and there may be visible tongues of fire that are evident. There are some things that are temporary, but I want to tell you there are some things that are permanent. There are some things that are permanent. And the flame that was kindled within the hearts of those people burned through the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So that all of those apostles, par one perhaps John, were martyred for their faith died and sealed their testimony with their precious blood. My dear people tonight, it gave them a flame that sent them out from the upper room, out into Jerusalem, to start the work that began to burn across the land and through Asia Minor, and in the first hundred years to cross across North Africa and right up into the lower regions of Europe. My dear people, the fire began to burn. And every time there's a gracious revival in the church, it is a blessing of divine flame. Evan Roberts was a young man. Whenever he got the vision and the passion for revival in the land of Wales, God met him as an individual. We have been where Evan Roberts was, in the pew where he was whenever the Spirit of God came upon him, and he began to pray. Bend me, bend me. And the flame of God was kindled in his heart. We went outside the little church and we stood beside the grave where Evan Roberts was later buried in his life. But from 13 years of age, young people hear me, from 13 years of age until 23 years of age, Evan Roberts prayed that God would meet him and God would visit Wales. And at 23 years of age, the revival fires began to burn. And what a mighty movement of God. The Welsh revival was one of the greatest missionary revivals because there went missionaries to the ends of the earth out of the Welsh revival. But one of the songs that was sung during that revival, these young people one of the girls who was the special blessed singer was 18 years of age. And here's what they would sing. While the fire of God is falling, while the voice of God is calling, brothers, get the flame. While the torch of God is burning, man's weak efforts overturning, Christians, get the flame. On the Holy Ghost relying, Simply trusting and not trying, you will get the flame. For the sake of Christ in glory and the spreading of the story, we must get the flame. Only soul for thy refining and thy clearer, brighter shining, do not miss the flame. On the Holy Ghost relying, simply trusting and not trying, you will get the flame. Brothers, let us cease our dreaming, and while God's flood tides are streaming, we will have the flame. Do you see how the bridge is made between what I've read and what I'm thinking about? The fire shall ever be upon the altar of my heart. I think I might be speaking to someone and you say, you know, Eric, there was a time when the flame was brighter in my heart. There was a time when I was a flame of fire, but the kindling has died down. 
As far as the flame at the altar was concerned, one thing had to be done every day. The ashes had to be taken out. And there needs to be an outtaking of the ashes, maybe in your life. Because now the flame has died. Something has quenched the flame. Something has come between you and God. Something has stymied the burning fire. What is it? You know. And God knows. And maybe on this final evening, in these moments, God is putting his finger on your life and has been on the earlier evenings. And he says, you know, I have, a, I have an issue with you, my brother, my sister. I, I, I've work that needs to be done in your heart. And you need to come back to where you once were. Like Job said, oh, that it were with me as it was in times past. The fire is burning low. This would be a great evening to rekindle the fire or let, let the Lord rekindle the flame in your heart. Thank God tonight there is the wonderful blessing of having the blessing of divine fire on the mean altar, as John or Charles Wesley put it, on the mean altar of my heart. When John the Baptist was preaching, he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there comes one after me who is mightier than I. I am not worthy to uh, loose his shoe latchet. He shall baptize you with Holy Ghost. And the Bible in the KJV says, with the Holy Ghost and fire. But in the original it is with Holy Ghost fire. They might be separate in the reading, but they are united in the Greek concept. Because the Spirit of God is a spirit of burning, to burn up every trace of sin, to bring the light and glory in, and to cleanse and purify and set a heart, a light and a flame for Jesus. John Wesley, as he traveled through the country, his life was like a living flame. He had a friend, and I read his book, The Christian Minister in Earnest, and it was said of him, his zeal was as a flame of fire. And Francis Asbury, who went to America on behalf of John Wesley, rode 250,000 miles on horseback and traveled through all weathers and over streams and across hillsides and mountains. And he, wherever there was people settling up house or home or camp, the first people on the ground were the Methodist circuit riders. And it used to be said that the people came to see the Methodists burn. <laughs> you know, there was a mission hall years ago and it went in fire. And there were a lot of people gathered around. And when they were watching it, somebody said, a wise crack said, it's not so often you see so many people at the mission hall. And somebody said, it's not every day you see the mission hall on fire. <laughs> Maybe tonight people would come more if that sacred flame of divine love and grace was manifest in our lives day by day, moment by moment, in our homes, in our relationships, with our wives, with our husbands, with our children, that they might gather around us and feel themselves safe and protected, feel themselves encouraged, feel themselves being prayed over and endued with the spirit of prayerfulness from their parents. Oh, my dear people tonight, God wants to touch us in our homes. He wants to touch us in our hearts. And He wants to touch us in our church life. And He wants to touch us in our our lives in the community and wherever we go that there's a kindling flame of this blessed Spirit's life and ministry flowing through our beings. The fire shall ever be upon the altar. It shall never be put out. We lived in Bangor in the 1970s and some years before that there was a wonderful man known to many and he was called S.T. Nelson. 
And S.T. Nelson was greatly used by the Lord as a minister in Bangor. And you know, he said this, The fire is promised, but in spite of the provision, so few have caught the flame. Consequently, purity and passion have been supplanted by laxity and lethargy. I wonder, does that resonate perhaps with you tonight? You say, well, you know, Eric, maybe that's me. Maybe that's me. You would be a good candidate tonight for the fire. You would be a good candidate tonight for the sacred flame. You would be a good candidate tonight to put your life on the altar for God and say, Lord, I'm raising an altar and I'm taking myself my life, my inmost self, I'm putting myself on the altar for God. I am as a consecrated offering. And Lord, I want you to take that and consume what's consumable and leave what survives the fire so that my life then might be a living flame for the glory of thy great name. I'm so glad this evening that there is a grace in Jesus that can make us like him, that can give us a living constancy that keeps on burning. That's what gripped Moses, wasn't it? As he looked at the little bush, and it said the bush burned, but it was not consumed. And it was Oswald Chambers who said, this is a picture of the sanctified and ready soul. It burns, but is not consumed. And the man who was keeping sheep stopped in his tracks. He had seen many bushes, spontaneous combustion in the wilderness. And they blew up and there was nothing but a dust spot left. But this was different. This burned. And the leaves continued to be green. And he said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is burning is not consumed. And God said, put off your shoes because you're on holy ground. And as that man drew near, God met with this man, Moses. And he who was a man at the backside of the desert with a faded vision and had forgotten about the people back in Egypt had left them 40 years earlier. God said, then I want to take you back and I want you to become the man in my hand to bring about their deliverance. Maybe tonight there's somebody and you would have a burning bush encounter. And you say, you know, Lord, I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight, because what I'm seeing, that's what I want to be. And then you can become that living flame to carry the message of a great Savior and Master and Lord, so that men and women might be wonderfully saved, that those who have died out and wilted away and are living in the blight of a burnt-out experience, can be rekindled, backsliders restored, people ushered into the fullness of the blessing of the Spirit in their lives, and then sent out to be a living flame for Jesus Christ. Yes, my dear people, when Yvonne and I were younger, we used to sing a lovely chorus, A Blaze for Christ a flame of fire for him, a blaze for Christ, for Jesus' souls to win, a life redeemed, a life of holiness unto him, a life on fire for God and souls, a blaze for Christ. You know, last night I came in and Sharon at the back said, I've got something for you. And she gave me a little envelope and inside it was a picture 
and I looked at it, had never seen it before, and there was a very young Caldwell Dara, and beside him was a 20-year-old Eric Stewart. Oh my, did I have lovely black hair in those days. And I know now why Yvonne fell for me. I don't know why she's stuck with me all these years. If we get three more weeks, we'll be 50 years in double harness. And I want to tell you, friends, we have got a very sweet relationship. I don't know when we've had a last word at each other. I, I cannot remember. We just get along sweet and nice. She says, Eric, do this, and I just say, done. She says, jump, and I say, how high? And that keeps everything going. Sweet as honey. Yes, my friends, it does work out. And all our children tonight are intensely interested in this meeting. And our youngest daughter sent us a message. How are the meetings going? I hope you have a great meeting tonight. And Wesley and Carl. And there's so many who are praying for this meeting. And these meetings all week. And the responses that we've had from quite a number of people, especially in a couple of nights, are because people have been praying. And there because some, there are some people who have an appetite to be on higher ground and have a desire to have a larger life and who want to be that flame, that living torch carrying the message, the ever-burning flame. And thank God tonight, as we come to the end of this week of meetings, the Lord Jesus tonight, through the ministry of His Spirit, is reaching out to you. And He's saying, are you going to get in on the tide of opportunity? Are you going to make this a red-letter mission evening? Are you going to meet with me and I'll meet with you? And whatever your condition is, I want to take you from where you are and bring you to where I want you to be. You say, Eric, I am not saved. I want to tell you that Jesus says, I want to take you from where you are and bring you into myself. You say, Eric, I am backslidden. Or there is an issue and the Lord has put his finger on it in my week of meetings, this week of meetings. Lord, I am doing business with you, and he wants to bring you from where you are to where he wants you to be. And he says tonight, if you're hungry and thirsty, I am here to fill you to the uttermost with my spirit, my power, my presence. The fire shall ever be upon the altar. It shall never be put out. Let me burn out for thee, dear Lord. Burn and wear out for thee. Let me not rust nor my life be a failure, my God, to thee. Use me and all I have, dear Lord. And get me so close to thee that I feel the throb of the great heart of God and my life burns out for thee. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, it is only by the ministry of thy Spirit that truth can become a living, searching flame into all our hearts. And it is by the ministry of that same Spirit that what is revealed then be taken and consumed by the fire of God and purged out of the life of the believer 
out of the heart. Lord, we thank you this evening that then there comes the living flame that sets our hearts ablaze for Christ. Just like Evan Roberts, who became that living flame in the revival, and out of that there went many people to many different lands, and what a great host there will be in heaven because one young man got the living flame and then began to urge others to get it too. Oh God, I pray, who knows the potential of this service? I pray that there will be one, yes, maybe two more, three, four, who will say, yes, I'm a candidate. I'm hungry. I open up my heart. Lord, come in. Purge me through and through. Fill me and set my heart aflame for your glory.